push them away. March on, mister. Be strong. Brave Louisa. Good morning, Lakes family. It is great to see you all on this like crazy, humid day, but we are gathered in the name of Jesus, and it is time for us to worship him together. So as I was praying this morning, I just felt like God wants to be known, that he wants you to know his holiness, how awesome and how how much he is um, above and beyond, greater than we could imagine, and yet at the same time, how outrageous and extravagant his love is for you. So Jesus, we love you. We thank you for gathering us here together. Today we gather in your name for your honor and for your glory. For you are holy, you are mighty, you are awesome, and you are worthy of praise. It is your breath that you have given us that we pour our praise back out to you. God, let us know you. Let us feel your love. Let us experience your presence as we submit our lives to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please rise.
I felt this all week long as I prayed about today and what was going to happen. I felt this again and again and again. And there was just this, this sureness, like 100% sureness that, um, that like everybody in here was, was like going to walk in here and the Lord is going to be pushing on one thing in their lives. There's going to be one thing, whether it's one sin that is just separating, just making them feel like they're just burdened and they're, they're, they're ashamed and they're worthless and and they just keep messing up and they're always going to keep messing up. And, or maybe it's one thing, you know, a life circumstance, a, a sickness, a burden, a weight. Maybe it's a financial difficulty or, or maybe it's unforgiveness towards somebody um, or whatever it is. That there's just going to be one thing. Or maybe you feel like the whole world is just falling apart all around you. And let me tell you that there's still one thing. The Lord is just saying, just release. Let me take it. Let me take it. And I just feel like the Lord right now in this moment I felt this so clearly as we were practicing today. You know, there's something that Jesus says. He says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. 
He, he, he wants to take your heavy burden. He paid for it on the cross. We, we no longer need to walk in shame and be broken. We no longer need to be burdened by our sin. We no longer need to be burdened by the things of this world, but we can walk with the easy and the light yoke of Jesus. We can walk in the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, he brings joy and peace, forgiveness. He comes and moves in our midst. And so what I want to challenge each and everybody today, because I believe, I believe that the Lord wants to touch your life. Whether you're five years old in the room or 85 years old, I believe that the Lord wants to touch you here in worship, wants to touch your heart. So whatever that one thing is, I want to just challenge you to say, Lord, I just give it to you. I surrender. Worship's totally just an act of surrender to the presence of the Lord. Lord, I surrender to this, and this is what I believe. I believe that Jesus is going to break chains here today off of your life. That he's going to, you're going to experience breakthrough in that sin. You're going to experience breakthrough in that situation. That you're going to experience breakthrough because that's what God does. Is he breaks away the chains. That's what the Lord does. He says you're set free. You're no longer burdened by the things of this world because I paid the price once and for all. And I give you eternal life. That you can walk in peace of the Lord and the joy of the Lord, the forgiveness of the Lord, the grace and the mercy of the Lord. And so we just declare that right now, Lord, that you're going to break away the chains on our life. And so we're going to sing this last song here. And listen, this is a declaration song for us today. This is just bringing to light what Jesus is doing in the spiritual realm. We're declaring, Jesus, you are going to break every chain. You have broken every chain on the cross. And Lord, we are going to leave our chains behind. We're not going to carry them with us as we go, Lord. But we're going to leave them behind. We're going to drop them off. Jesus, you break every chain in our lives. And we worship you. So come on, everybody. Let's sing this song.
And he is a God of goodness and of love and of freedom. And that is where he wants you to walk. And that army rising up is a people who profess his name, who live in his love, and who live in his freedom, and who bring that light into the world. Bring in his kingdom to be in this world, in this world of darkness. And we are those people in his name and for his glory. It's your name we praise, Jesus. We, we love you, Jesus, the mighty one, the holy one, the worthy one. We gather for your glory. And it's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Here at the Lakes, we believe that offering is worship. And there's no greater God to worship than our God. He is worthy of all that we have and all that we are. And so as we give offering today, let's do it with delight. Let's do it with joy. For we are serving the greatest God there is to serve. And he's worthy of all that we have. And so Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for giving us hope and freedom and love and we thank you for who you are because you are holy and awesome and so this offering that we give is an act of worship to you because we love you we pray this in jesus name amen, amen. there's an offering basket in the back so you can drop a physical offering in there or you could give online at lakeswapaka.com and you can even text to give all right. Well, you guys can grab a seat here quick. And I believe, like, as we, um, as we talk about offering you, this week, my sister, um, she uh, told me a, a testimony of something that happened at her church. She's a worship leader at a church. And, um, and uh, you know, the July was their year end for their church, like, financially. And so, you know, the admins, because, uh, you know, this, this is how I... They, they sometimes think, you know, they're like, oh, it's the year end. We need to, like, push giving, make sure that we, you know, clear the bank account and have enough money at the end of the, um, at the, end of the month. And um, so they, you know, they're kind of like, well, so push, you know, make sure pastors that you go out and push giving. And, um, and so one pastor, this is a church, they have, like, 10 campuses or something. So one of the pastors at their campus um, was like, um, I don't think God wants me to talk about giving. Um, I think that he just wants us to pray for people who need financial breakthrough. And, um, and so they ended up praying. They didn't do, you know, they didn't talk about giving one time that month or in the, you know, in the normal or, ex, you know, ex, uh, exaggerated ways. And they just prayed for people um, who maybe needed a job or whatever it was. And um, they not only had like the largest month of giving ever in the history of their church, but they also saw more breakthrough in people's lives. And so she's telling me this story, and I just felt the Lord be like, do that. Um, and so, and, and I've had numerous, I've had this week two missionaries, okay, this is the first week in eight months that a single missionary has reached out to me. 
two missionaries have reached out this week with needs, financial needs. Um, I, I know three different individuals who've come to me with um, a job crisis or a money crisis this week. Um, and so I think we need to act on that. And so what I want to invite right now in this moment so is, is if, if, if you need prayer for um, whether it's you're, you're looking for a job or you need a financial breakthrough, whether there's some oppression coming against you financially that, that you know, maybe it's in your business or in your life that you just are looking for, you don't know where the answer is going to come from. Or even if it's, you know, um, you know if, if you're here on behalf of maybe um, your son or your daughter who needs a breakthrough in your life. What I want to ask you to do, and there's no shame in this, I just, I believe that the Lord wants to touch your life. I would just want to ask you to stand up. Um, if, if that's you. If you just want prayer for finances right now in this place, I just want you to ask to stand up. There's no shame here. There's nothing. Like, I believe that the Lord wants to, to move in your life. And so, um, here's what I want to ask that just, is there anybody else? I just want to ask that, um, like, if you guys are comfortable, whoever, if you're friends, if you brought somebody, just put your hand on their shoulder or something or somebody around you. Um, and for those of you over here, just stretch out a hand and um, just pray for them right now. You don't need to know what their issue is at all, but just pray that the Lord blesses them, that the Lord moves in their life. Lord, we just ask that you come, like everybody just pray in your own way um, and, and lift them up. Lord, we ask that you come and break through in their lives, Lord, and you bring a blessing to them, Jesus, that you, prov you provide a way through if there's a bill that they need to pay, Lord, that you provide the money to pay it, Lord, and, and that you lead them, whether it's you lead them to a new job, whatever it is, Lord, we just pray for breakthrough and blessing financially in their lives, Lord, and we know that you are a God who is all-powerful. You're all-consuming. You are greater than any bank. You are greater than any um, statement. You're greater than any bill, Lord, and you can do anything. So, Lord, we just ask for your financial blessing. And, Lord, we ask that you provide a way and you, you, you lead them to jobs. Lord, you lead them to life. You lead them to the place that you want them in. And you give them the wisdom that they need for their lives. So right now, Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we just pray a blessing over them. Thank you, Jesus, for moving in our midst. You are powerful, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In this next uh, section, we want to give credit where credit is due. And so we want to lift up the name of Jesus. And so what has Jesus, where have you seen him at work in your life this week. Maybe it's an answer to prayer. Maybe it's a, a miracle that you have been praying for. Maybe it's a scripture verse that the Lord has laid on your heart, or maybe it's a word that he has for the congregation, or whatever it is. We want to give credit to Jesus. We want to lift him up, and that raises the faith of the entire congregation. And so if you have a testimony that you want to share, just raise your hand, and we'll run the mic to you, and we want to hear about it and celebrate with you. There's Becky there, and I know Laura, too. Yeah. John, if you could just go to a blank slide. We'll do the video after. Good morning. Um, oh, this is totally the Holy Spirit because it wouldn't be here if I if it wasn't. Um, God's timing is perfect, and so many people were involved, um, not just me. It started with Pastor Logan's messages on the Holy Spirit and um, just that hunger for more of Him in my life and more sensitivity and me praying and asking, like, Holy Spirit, be loud in my life. Slap me in the face with what it is you want me to say or do. I surrender. And um, for several months, um, I had friends in my life who um, were had a relative and a, a really good friend who had cancer, and they found out it was going to be terminal. And at different times, they didn't even know that they were each talking to me, like to each other. Um, so at different times, the one would say, yeah, it's really sad. You know, he's got two young girls who are getting ready to go to college and his wife, and he's not a believer. He doesn't know Jesus. And I was just like, oh, yeah, that's awful. And I didn't know this man at all. Um, and then I had another friend 
who would talk about it and just say, you know, I'm praying for a miracle. I'm praying that God moves mightily in his life. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to pray that with you. And I prayed that every single day for this man. And um, time was getting close. And one, somebody had, the one friend had said, you know, I don't even know how he's still holding on. He's really on death's door. And uh, I just said, you know, maybe he's waiting. God's waiting for him to surrender. He's not going to take him till he says, God, help me. Jesus, I need you. And um, the one day I was with the other friend. I'm trying to make this as clear as I can. I was with that one friend, and I'm like, so what's going on? How is he doing? You know, his girls are getting ready to go to college. Could you imagine them leaving and dad's still holding on? Like, how, did, how are they going to do this? And she was very emotional, and it just hit me, like, just as clear as can be. Becky, you need to reach out to him and say the saving prayer with him. I'm like, I don't know him. Yeah, therefore, it's easy. Like, it's, I'm like, I can, I can do that. I'm going to do it. And that was on a Tuesday. And I prayed about it and prayed about it, and then it kind of go away. And then it came back. You got to reach out. Okay, God, how do you want me to reach out? I'm not sure. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And I don't know when this guy's going to go. And on Saturday, I was just getting ready, and it just hit me. Send him a message on Facebook. But he's not my friend. How is he going to see it? Because a lot of times those go missed. I sent the message, and I just said, you know, we have mutual friends. I am praying for you. Um, I know this is weird, but it's from God, so blame him. <laughs> and uh, I just said, if you believe, and I just, you know, went through and that, you know, we're sinners. We don't deserve this, but God said we do. We are worthy of this, and you can have eternity in heaven and someday be reunited with your girls and your wife. Um, and I prayed over it, and I sent it, and I was like, you got to send it to his wife, too. So, can you please share this with your husband? And I just prayed over it, and I was so nervous. And about an hour later, the message pops up, and all I see is hearts and thank yous. I didn't open it because I was nervous. But I was like, whoo, okay, I'm really excited about this. And she had said, thank you so much. Your prayer was beautiful. We prayed it together. And... Um, I was just touched by that and thankful. Um, three days later, I got a text from one of my friends that said he passed away. And I was just like, oh, Holy Spirit, thank you that I didn't miss that because yeah. I would be so broken and full of regret if this man suffered in pain and agony with the disease of cancer on earth and then went to hell in the deepest of darkness and torment but now he's like free and healthy and whole and dancing Amen. with the angels praise the lord praise the lord on this past week i was having a very weak moment i'd had like three days of just if anything could go wrong it did and i my my body ached from still cleaning up after the tornado that went through West Bloomfield last month. But anyways, it was time to clean all the, the gutters in the house, um, the rain gutters, because it was going to rain. And so I'm out there, this big, long extension on my leaf blower, and there's a strap that goes around on my across my shoulder, and that strap kept coming off, and I didn't know why, it just did. And it was making me so angry, and it was a deal where my shoulder ached anyway from all the work I've been doing, and I started to cuss. And I took the Lord's name in vain. That's how frustrated I was. And as soon as those ugly words parted from my lips, this little voice in my head said, do you know, I can see the devil over there with a great big smile on his face. You are making him so happy. And God is sad, but
but the devil is happy. Good job, Laura. And it was as clear as a bell in my head. And it really woke me up. And I thought, that is, that's not my mission. And I remembered, oh, many, many, many Sundays ago, DJ stood up in front of this congregation and she said a prayer that was the most powerful prayer I've ever heard. And she told the devil to take a hike. <laughs> and that prayer came back to me. And I thought, well, if she can do it, I can too. Because I know that the devil has just been hanging over me in sheer delight that I am just a human and very gullible. And so I changed my tune. And I thought, well, you know, my cuss words aren't hurting that leaf blower at all, but it's hurting, <laughs> it's hurting me and it's hurting God. So I told the devil, hey, I love God. He is my heavenly father. And I love his son, who is my Lord and savior. And I have no use for you. And they are so much more powerful than you could ever be. Amen. So get out of here. I don't want you around me. I have no allegiance to you. My allegiance is to God and Jesus. Amen. So get away from me. Take a hike. I don't want you around anymore. And I am not going to let you get the best of me because my God is powerful. And you know what? I put that leaf blower, strapped it back on me. The strap never came off. <laughs> My shoulder stopped aching. And I am so grateful that DJ said that prayer that day because I got to use it and chase the devil away. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. Well, um, I'm going to dismiss kids. You guys can be dismissed. <laughs> they weren't ready. Um, and uh, youth are staying in here today with us. Yes, sorry. I didn't say that. Youth can stay. Um, this is the perfect timing. Lord, thank you for sharing that story. Um, because I, uh, I have a... Before we get to the video, I just, I want to just say this. When I got here in, if you don't know, I started here as, as the pastor um, in January. So when we got here, the Lord highlighted a few people to me. And um, one of the people that the Lord highlighted was DJ. And um, the Lord said, like very clearly about DJ, he said, because of her prayer, like, well, well, what's, what's going to happen here through this ministry is because of her prayers. And um, it was very clear. And I've always had just a deep, like, respect. Um, I mean, and, and just she's a powerful woman of God. Um, and, and she's done, you know, many of you know her way more than I do. Um, and she's done a lot. But so I want, if you would, take a second and turn your attention to the screens. We have an announcement from her. Uh, our lives have always been pretty transparent. And I know uh, some people know about this, so I just want you to get it from the horse's mouth so you don't have to try to figure out what's the truth and what's guesswork. Um, I was recently diagnosed with breast cancer that has spread to my lungs and liver. It is not treatable. <clears throat> and the prognosis is I have weeks to live. So I'm, I want you to know I'm not scared or upset. It's okay. My father's still in control, and I won't be leaving planet Earth one minute before he sends someone to come and get me. So from my perspective, this could play out three different ways. Um, if this old body is too tired to keep going, I will be more alive than I've ever been before. And I feel bad about the people that I'll leave behind, but 
I'll be busy. <laughs> or my father could say, whoa, slow down here and extend those weeks to a longer period of time, which would be great. I would, I would like that. Or he could choose my first preference and see me healed. That would be my first choice, and I'm willing to receive prayer, and we have plans to pray at church, and other people are praying for me. So I welcome your prayers. God bless you. Am I there? There I am. Um, obviously, that's that's a, a sad announcement from DJ, but I also want to just point out. I mean, um, she, I mean, you can when there's a you know when there's a warrior for God, you can see it. Um, and how clearly, I mean, I know many of you have had to face a diagnosis similar to that, or a diagnosis of cancer or something, and and it's a scary thing. Um, and, and, you know, when death is staring you in the face, um, your faith becomes real very quickly. Um, and so DJ is such an encouragement to all of us. She has always stood on the rock of Jesus and never wavered. Um, but we want you to keep her in your prayers. And so I'm going to pray for her quick. Um, she's not with us here this morning, um, but she's, she will be in. Um, and, and so, Lord, we just lift DJ up to you, Lord. We thank you for her life. Lord, we thank you that she has been a powerful prayer warrior, Lord. <laughs> and many of demons have shuddered because of her. Um, Lord, because of her prayers and because of her love for you. Um, and so, Lord, we just ask that uh, you just move in her and you continue to move in her in a mighty way. Lord, we would love to see her healed. For her to be even if it's possible, a bigger testimony of your goodness, your grace, your mercy, and your healing power. Um, but Lord, we just thank you. We thank you. Lord, I thank you that there are many people in these seats today because of her prayers. Um, Lord, we thank you for, for who she is and for what she means to this community and what she means on a spiritual level and, Lord, what she means to the kingdom of heaven. Um, so thank you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I am going to um, try and uh, be efficient here. Um, but first, I need my dart board. Um, does anybody like to play darts? Um, so Haley and I used to, uh, when we lived in Janesville, there was this really awesome place called Sneakers. And they had the best cheese curds in Janesville, which how, like, I mean, there's, there's a, like, the restaurant that you choose, I mean, there's few things that are above, like, where's the best cheese curds? Like, and if there is, like, I don't want to go to dinner with you, unless your answer is Mexican, then let's go to dinner, because I will always choose Mexican over anything. Um, but we, our date night, prior to our little beautiful girl entering into the world, was we would go and get pizza and cheese curds, and we would go and play darts. You know, I am an extremely competitive person, and this is a competition that Haley and I can do where I almost let her win, but never <laughs> let her win. Um, but anyways, like I was thinking about, you know, what the Lord was kind of putting on my heart to share with you today, this week, and um, he's like, he gave me this picture of darts. And uh, the thing about darts is like, all of us in this room could play it, but we would all be in a different situation, right? Like some of us in the room is like, come on, ask me to come up. I'm going to hit a bullseye right away. Like I guarantee it. Like, come on. Like, like I'm just waiting to be asked. And others in this room, if you came up here, everybody would be in danger. <laughs> like the board's over there, but you're not safe back there. No wonder these sections are empty here. Like, everybody would be in danger. And I think, you know, there's, there's an element of this of, like, our Christian walk. And, you know, with um, some of us in the room are, like, 
really close. You work really, really hard at it, and you try, you try, and you try, and you try, and you try. But it's like, you know, like my favorite game of, of darts is, is cricket. So if you know what cricket is, like there's like 301 where you just literally close your eyes and you throw it at the board and your score counts against it or whatever. But my favorite is cricket, and cricket means you can only hit certain numbers. And you need a set number of certain numbers, okay? And everything else doesn't matter at all. So you have to be really, really precise, right? And so there's this element of like, you can be close, but it doesn't matter. And so like, I feel like, you know, many times in our Christian walks, for some of us, we're like really, really good. Sometimes we just hit it, you know, we're, we're right on and we just keep hitting it. And then we just get, we just, we miss it just a little bit. And it's like, I'm not good enough. And I'm not making it others of us, like if we hit the board, we're lucky, right? Like just the fact that we're here at church today is like a work of God. It's a miracle because my life is chaos and I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking about Jesus, but it's really not a real thing. Like I'm really not like, like tuned in on it. I'm really not, you know, in, in the game. And, and we get to this place where, you know, As we walk with the Lord, we slowly ma we, we mature with the Lord. It's called, you know, the process of sanctification. We grow closer and closer to the Lord, hopefully. Um, but for many of us, and I feel like this has been just taught just a little bit too much because it takes the life of a living God out of this. For many of us in this pursuit of the Lord... We just constantly live in that phase of just like trying to throw the perfect dart, but never being able to be perfect. And after a while, we begin to lose the life and the joy of the Lord in it. You know, and the reason I love cricket so much is because like, if you miss with your dart, your dart is worthless. And so it's, it's, it's either you hit your spot or you don't. There's nothing in between. And at the end of the day with the Lord, there's only one thing that matters. There's only one thing that matters. And being close is not good enough, but for many of us, <laughs> we're pursuing the wrong thing. We're pursuing the wrong thing. And so here's what I want to just put on you here as we start this message, I believe that the Lord is asking something of you today. Each and every person here, whether you've been a believer your whole life or whether you're not a believer at all, and you're just here, I believe that the Lord is asking, there's something on your heart, there's something that he is pushing on, he is asking something of you, I know he's asking something of me, because I'm struggling with it. I'm in there, and I, so I believe this, and I want to look at this, this story that Jesus tells us in scripture. And it's found in Luke chapter 18. It says, a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And listen to what Jesus says. He says, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. Okay, so this is Jesus being sarcastic. And he's, he's like pushing a knife in on here. He's saying like, no one is good at, except God alone. So he's confronting this ruler that we have in this. He was not a religious ruler, but he was, he was probably of some authority, you know, uh, some lordship or something, you know, in, in, in society. He, so he clearly, he had wealth, um, and he clearly was in charge of people. He had a significant role in some sort of a way. We don't hear much more about it. We just know he wasn't probably a religious leader because um, in Mark it says he was, he was young, <laughs> and religious leaders weren't young. They were old um, in, the, in the Jewish culture. And so, um, but he says, Jesus says, why do you call me good? Now the answer, this, this points to the very thing that Jesus is getting at in this whole entire story. And so many times I've heard money messages be preached about this. This sermon is, or this text is not at all about money. Is there's, like, there's like nothing to do with money in this in this. The, the only thing that, that is anything to do with money is the fact that the guy had money. It is not at all about your money. 
And this question right here is, it's, highlights everything that Jesus is trying to unlock. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. What Jesus is saying is that if you're going to call me good, then you better call me God. And so there's, there's no ability, and we'll, we'll see this unlocked as the rest of this passage plays out. Right? But if he's going to come and say, good teacher, then he better be God. And so that's what Jesus is not saying, I'm not God. That's not what he's saying. But he's, this is a little bit of sarcasm from Jesus, which I love because I believe Jesus was like a snarky guy. I believe that Jesus was like the comeback king. I mean, like, he wasn't like this, oh, you're so nice. No, he drove the knife into you. He drove it home. No one is good except God alone. And listen to this. He says, you know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. And honor your father and your mother. And look at, look at this. Look at the ignorance. All of these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. How many parents in the room, how many times have your children honored you every second of their lives, right? We all know. But it was actually taught in the Jewish, like there was this, it was taught that you could keep the commandments, that you could keep them all. So like there's an essence of like he believes what he's saying. He believes what he's saying. And whether or not that's necessarily true, like we see Jesus drive home the stake here. Verse 22, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, he didn't argue with him. He didn't argue with him. But he says, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Come and follow me. What is he talking about by treasure in heaven? (laughs) Well, you could easily argue that he's talking about the wonderful treasure of eternal life, the wonderful treasure of the goodness of God and what is waiting for us in heaven. <laughs> but it's really pointing to come and follow me and listen to what this says. Verse 23, when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. He became very sad. And then Jesus says this. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And this is where Jesus, you know, I was talking to somebody about this story and they're like, I think that Jesus was like, he just looked around and he saw a camel and he's like, oh, this would be a good illustration. But it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, I just want to stop right here. Because in this culture, your wealth and status said how much you were blessed. Look at how anti-cultural what Jesus is saying. Right? I don't think that's, it's not as much... Like, I don't think that's as much in the church today, like, that we would think that as much as they certainly thought it. It still is there a little bit, right? But their their position in life, like, that's how much favor you have with the Lord. But yet, Jesus is saying, those who are rich, man, it is hard to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 26, he says, those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Who can be saved? And Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said to him, We have left all we had to follow you. And Jesus replies, Truly I tell you, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much as this in the age, or as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. (laughs) And so as I was looking through this and studying this week, my commentary wrote this this statement, and I love this so much. 
says, when anyone takes seriously the requirements of the law, he is on the way to coming to Christ. I love this so much because this is a theologian. Actually, like so many times I feel like theologians get caught in the works. They get caught in like, you need to follow Jesus. And they maybe think like it's not about works, but then they list like the 50,000 works that you need to do in order to follow Jesus. But he said, when anyone takes seriously the requirements of the law, law, he is on the way to coming to Christ, right? Obeying the law is not a bad thing. Obeying the law is still something that the Holy Spirit leads you to do and wants you to do and to be obedient to Jesus. Jesus asks us, and one of the ways that we love him and that we show our love for him is through obedience. But obeying the law is not salvation. Jesus is the salvation. And look at this. Look at the five commandments that Jesus quotes. Oops, sorry. Let me go back here. Are they all up there? All right. Look at the five commandments that Jesus quotes. Adultery, murder, stealing, lying, and honor your father and mother. These are the five commandments that are about our action. So he says, look, you're doing all the right things. Your actions are good. But then look at what Jesus does not say. No other gods before me, idolatry, the Lord's name in vain, keeping the Sabbath holy and coveting. This is what Jesus, you know, Jesus is like, oh, yeah, do these things. The things that people are like, if I do these things, if I don't lie, if I don't commit adultery, if I don't, you know, if I don't murder anybody, that's a high bar right there, right? If I don't do those things, like, I'm, I'm, I'm good. But then he says there's one thing. There's one thing that you don't have, and in all of these, build that same thing of, of who is the Lord to you. This is not about money. This is not about selling your possessions at all. Who is the Lord to you? Do you have a God before God? Do you have idols in your life? Idols are anything that are higher than God in your life. Anything that separates you from the Lord. Anything that you honor or worship above the Lord. Do you, do you take the Lord's name in vain? Do you, protect, do you take a Sabbath day where you honor and worship the Lord and remember what he did for you? And again, this man was wealthy. So, I mean, what do, what do wealthy people do? They work many tirelessly, seven days a week. Do you honor the Sabbath? Do you keep the Lord, you know, like Chick-fil-A, right? They, keep, they take Sundays off because they believe that what they stand for as, a, as an organization is more important than the money they could gain from that one day. Sadly, though, like the only day I go to Chick-fil-A is on Sundays. <laughs> and don't covet, don't want things and desire things above Don't hold on to things like they're yours. Because this is all pointing to who is the Lord for you? Who is the Lord? And so what Jesus was asking this man is did, or like what we're seeing here is, is did God really have his heart? That's the, that's the challenge of this passage. Did God really have his heart? Did he really love the Lord? Or was he just doing what he thought was the right thing to do? And so I want to, you know, break this down a little bit. Here's another quote from my commentaries this week. It says, the affluent are always tempted to rely on things earthly, and they do not find it easy to cast themselves on the mercy of God. And so, if you don't know this, you live in America, you're rich, okay? I don't think there's anybody here who, from a world perspective, I can't remember what's, you're like in the top 2% in the world's income. So, like, there's very few things that we need to rely on the Lord for. But this is not actually, <laughs> like, the language that is used in the original text here is not just, ta it's not just talking about money. 
Like, you can break this down further, and so anybody who's rich in, in giftings and talent, right? Because if you're really good at something, what do you do? You run in that, and you're the Lord of that, and you're the one who's really good at it, and you're the one who carries it out. When you have a lot of money, it's your money. You're the one who earned it. You're the one who proved a way. In their service and their abilities, the affluent means much more. So then who can be saved? Who can be saved? Well, there's another thing that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 5 where he clearly talks about this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for in theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And as you break this verse down, he's not talking about like, hey, you need to be worthless and be poor in spirit as far as like you have no integrity or no strength or you're just like a little, a little, you know, doormat that just gets stepped on by things. No, it's that you lay down your life and you pick up the kingdom of God and that is the thing that is the richest thing that you could ever pursue. Blessed are the ones who know that it's not about them. It's about the Lord. And this is not, um, like if I were to bless somebody, like if I were, you know, or or whatever, like if I was to bless somebody and give them 20 bucks, right? That's like an action of blessing. This is not like you are blessed through that. This blessed word in the original language is a position. It, It like... I don't want to go down this too far, but um, it's, 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 bear with me here, you theologians, don't yell at me for being heretical here, but there, there I can't explain this, but it's, it's, it's a, it's like, there's a way that you could say this is, happy is the position of those who are poor in spirit. It's not about like, oh, if you're poor in spirit, you're going to just be, you know, but it's, it's a position where it's like, I have joy and life in my life because I have the kingdom of heaven. And so it's a positional thing that you take. And so the poor in spirit can receive the kingdom of heaven, but the ones who are rich in their own spirit struggle to see that they need something else. And so here, this wealthy man is like, hey, I could buy this. Or, hey, I could, what do I need to do? But the one thing that he holds on to the most is the one thing that Jesus came for. And listen, I think, like, if we break down all of Christianity into something that's really, really simple, I think that the Lord always comes to us with one thing. The Lord is always asking you to do one thing. And it's different for all of us. There are some of you that the Lord might be asking you, hey, go and sell all of your things, give it all to the poor, give it all to the church, do whatever, and, and like, then you'll be blessed. Like that's, that's what, like, that's what the Lord might be asking you to do. I don't know. But there's others who are like, hey, give up that sin, that one sin. You know what it is. You know it's separating you from the Lord. You know it's holding you down. Or forgive your spouse. I feel that right now. Somebody needs to forgive their spouse. Probably all of us, but men, just kidding. Maybe there, there's one thing, and, and, and listen, the, the way to experience the Holy Spirit in the most powerful way is you respond to the one thing that the Holy Spirit asks you to do. And there's a quote that I love to say. <laughs> I say it in this, when, when Jesus, or when the Holy Spirit comes and asks you to love him, don't make him a sandwich, just love him. Respond to what the Lord is asking of you from your heart. It's not about a list of to-dos that we just walk through in obedience and think that just because we check those boxes that we're good. It's about loving the Lord with all that we are. And it's about responding to him. Just like, I mean, this is, this is what it would be like in that example. So like, I know this is a, a little sexist, but I, I love when Haley makes me a sandwich, okay? She makes so much better sandwiches than me, okay? I, well, sandwiches taste so much better when somebody else makes it. I don't know why that's the case, but it's just the truth. But, like, if all Haley ever did was make me a sandwich, 
how much of a relationship would that be? Like literally, it's like, I'm tired and I'm exhausted and I just want to go to bed. And she's like, here's a sandwich. <laughs> we just came home from a steakhouse dinner. It was so good. We're so full. Here's a sandwich. <laughs> right? Like if we're not responding to the Lord where the Lord wants to, if we're not in communion with the Lord, then we're going to be missing where the Lord wants to bless us in our life and move in our lives. Salvation, salvation for rich or for the poor is always a miracle of God's grace. It is always God's gift. So it's not about a to-do list. It's about surrendering your life and saying Jesus is Lord. And so what is the one thing that the Lord is asking from you today? I challenge you, do not ignore it. Otherwise, you will continue to walk in a mediocre relationship with the Lord. Until you respond to him, you will not experience the Lord to the fullest ability. Because it's not the Lord holding back, it's you. It's not the Lord, you know, not moving in your life. It's our unwillingness to surrender. And so this was a huge ask for this guy. And it was a, it was, there was a very clear direction that the Lord gave this guy. And what did he do? He got sad because he did not want to let go of what he loved. And so if you broke this whole par um, passage down to one sentence, Jesus is saying... Do you love me more than that? Do you love me more than that sin? Do you love me more than your money? Do you love me more than, you know, your burden? Do you love me more than, you know, the fear of going and, for, you know, apologizing? Do you love me? Whatever it is, do you love me more? And look at this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. It says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. The Lord will respond. Amen? Amen. All right. I'm going to try and do something here. <laughs> what? I don't think I can make a bullseye. Nope. <laughs> All right, fine. Nope. Oh, it's close. Um... All right, I'm calling this a mini vision Sunday because I want to share something, um, what the Lord is, is kind of where we're at here. I've been here for eight months or so now, or seven months, I don't know what month it is, eight months, and, um, and uh, I want to, we don't spend hardly any time here at the lakes talking about us, okay? We want to be all about Jesus, um, we want to be all about worshiping Him, all about what He's doing in our lives, all about His movement. And so, um, but there is, there is a nature to church um, that is different. We're not a business that sells things, that makes money, and then, like, can provide for things, okay? Right? Like, we have a, we have a, a building here. We have a ministry here and everything. Like, it is an interesting perspective to, like, literally be making, you know, decisions when you're fully dependent on the Lord providing. You're fully dependent on the Lord touching people's lives and then being obedient and to give. And there's nothing that says, like, you know, what is going to happen or what, what the future of the church is going to hold. And so I want to just share a couple things. I'm really excited for some of these things. Just share a couple things about what we feel that the Lord is doing and where he might be taking us um, and some of our needs. And so the, the first thing that I want to share is, is where I'm at. Um, I want to share that, like, I believe that the Lord has called me here and Haley here, this is where we are rooted. Like, I believe that the Lord is, I've always believed that the Lord is going to do something special in my life, something that, um, where, where I, I've always had this dream, you know, in my heart, just rooted in me that, like, someday the Lord is going to put me in a position where, where people from around the world come to see what he's doing. And I've always had that dream since I was, you know, since I first got called into ministry. That's always been a dream on my heart. And I believe that the Lord is doing that here at the lakes. I am fully committed here. I believe that the Lord is going to continue to pour out his spirit on the lakes. I believe that he is 
chosen the lakes, and this has been prophetically spoken over the lakes before my time and since I've been here, that the lakes will, is, is chosen by the Lord to be a minister of his presence in a great way, and that he's sending people to Wapaka, and he's sending people to the lakes, not for their job, maybe that's what they mask it in, but he's sending them here to be touched by the presence of Jesus. That's really what I believe, and I believe that it's happened. It happened with me. It happened with a few of you that I know, and it's also, you know, it's happening with Phil and Jean, who are, who are my best friends. They're coming here next month. They're moving here. Like, the Lord is calling people here because he wants to touch their life, and so I believe that, and so I just want to first say, like, I am, I am all in here. Um, I, you know, am prophetically speaking over my children of the ministry that they're going to do here at the lakes, like, and so I, like, I know I, I'm, I'm a young gun and I'm a little energetic, but like, I'm, be, like, I'm here. I want, I'm thinking about what is this ministry going to look like in 30 years and what I want to see the Lord do. And, and, and I think the Lord is going to do great, great things. And so as we talk about vision, though, you always have to talk about where you're at. And so here's a few things about our building specifically of where we're at. Um, I don't know if you know this, but um, our bathrooms, we, okay, let me just tell you, we know our bathrooms are not nice. Okay, they are, they, they are nicer. We, we fixed them up to the, to the ability that we could, but here's the deal. In order for us to redo our bathrooms, they're no longer grandfathered in, and we need $200,000 to redo our bathrooms. And in order for us to do that, we need to take either the kitchen or the lobby or the coat room or all of the above. Okay, so that, you know, codes change over the years. And so that's why the bathrooms are how they are. Um, and so that's... So there's a, there's a need there. I don't know if you've noticed, but our kitchen is not a top-of-the-line beautiful thing. It functions, and it's nice, um, but uh, it could use some tender, loving care, and this is the same exact thing. In order for us to, like, alter our kitchen, we all of a sudden open up the door to a bunch of new codes and a bunch of money. Um, office and meeting space, we have more staff than we have offices. We don't have great places for small groups. We don't have um, specific, like, youth space. We don't have a space for our youth. And so they're just using other spaces. Um, one thing that I, I, I hate is we don't have space for people to come and be ministered to here in the front. This is as many chairs as we can pack in this room. Um, and, and we don't have space for prayer. We don't have space at the altar. Um, and and. I don't know if you look around, but the chairs are slowly filling up. And if you say there's a lot of empty chairs in this room, I will argue then, okay, start sitting next to each other because there's open chairs still, but yet we're filling up our capacity. And then last but not least, um, did everybody get a parking spot today? Um, I know many of you sacrificially parked across the street. Thank you so much. But so, so these are some of the needs that are currently pressing on our church. Um, and, and so it would be stupid for us to address these needs without thinking of where we're going, right? It would be stupid for us to spend $200,000 on bathrooms and then realizing like, oh, we need more space for this, and now we need to change the bathrooms or something like that, right? And so I want to tell you where we're going. I want to tell you where I believe all of our spiritual lead team and our um, trustee council, our financial leaders here in the church, know this plan. Um, they uh, have told me that they believe that this is the Lord and they're, they're supporting this. And so I really firmly believe that this is where the Lord is taking us. And so I want to, I want to show you a couple things, though, here um, before I hit next here. Um, behind this beautiful, wonderful um, curtain here. Um, and so I don't know if anybody was around for this. I think, oh boy, I think Gary was eight years old, right, Gary? Yeah. <laughs> so this is the original drawing, architectural drawing of this church. 
This is from 1960. The building was built in 1969, so it was prior to that. Um, and so we're going to frame this somewhere, but it's just a great reminder of this was the original dream. This is what the original Shepherd of the Lakes Church came and planted here. And so there's that. And then somebody along the way had this dream. This is the original artistic drawing of the Fellowship Hall area, the addition over there, which was built in the 80s. And so this is the drawing. And so now um, I just want to share with you, here's a dream of where we would love to go as a church because it would address our needs. And we want to make decisions that are financially smart and they're not going to waste money or cause us to reduce our ability to minister the gospel. Because that is the number one thing. That's the reason we're here. The church, the building, it's just a tool to share the gospel in. And so um, here's a little picture. Here's a few pictures. Um, and so the dream would be is that right now you are in the lobby. This would be our main entrance to the church. It would highlight um, all of our stained glass. And, you know, someday we could have a carport. That would be awesome, um, you know, for for people in the rain and stuff like that. And um, just a beautiful, we take advantage of all of the beautiful architecture to this building. Um, and we make this the lobby. And we build a new sanctuary, fellowship hall, and kitchen off the back side of our building. So here's just a few pictures of what it could maybe look like. Um, and like what's an example here, um, just of kind of the, the space that we have. And so here's why I'm sharing this. And I'll just, I'm, I'm running through this. I know we're not asking for money. We're not asking for anything today. We're just sharing a, a vision of where we believe the Lord is leading us. Um, and so it would allow us to not only have more capacity in our sanctuary, it would give us the ability to have a dedicated youth space. It would give us the ability to make our children's space a lot nicer. It would give us bathrooms. Woo! It would um, give us more office space to grow into and to come up to what we need right now. We, you know, it would give us a conference room space for us to hold meetings because right now, you know, we just, everybody just uses the fellowship hall. And that's not the best place for, you know, um, things that need to be, you know, or, you know, personal accountability and privacy matters and, and blah, 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 blah. And so this would also give us space um, to grow as a church family. The vision of our church is that when we gather together, we come and meet with the presence of the Lord. Okay, so we're, we're not going to cookie cutter this. We're not going to try to reproduce meeting with the Lord. We're not going to make it inauthentic. We're going to hold one service where we come and where we worship together. That's our plan. And so we're going to do whatever we need to do to make our space so that we can fit and that we can open up room for more people to come and worship with us and more people to come and enjoy Jesus. And so if you're saying, why don't you just go to eight services I don't want uh, the burden on my heart. Like, I, I believe that we're supposed to come and meet with the Lord. And there's no timeline on that. There's no timetable. There's no set thing of what that looks like. We're going to come and we're going to respond to what the Lord is asking of us. And so, you know, that, that's a firm belief in me. And I believe that if we stand on what we firmly believe that we as a church will open the door for people to authentically meet Jesus. Not, not a to-do list, not a, a, a fake Jesus, not a partial Jesus, but the real living King who is the Lord and Savior of our lives. And so here's just an example. And then, you know, um, it, this might take a little while, but this would be one of my favorite things. We'd have an elevator, which would be cool, but then this would be like, a new fellowship hall below the sanctuary, and a new kitchen that is um, double the size of our current kitchen as well as um, more of a commercial kitchen so that we could do food preparation for, um, you know, if we ever wanted to do a meal ministry or anything like that. Um, and you'll find out here in about three minutes 
that our fellowship hall right now is tight, um, and this would allow us, you know, to seat like 400 people around, um, you know, three to 400 people around tables and to eat, and so no matter what happens with our church, we're going to continue to eat and break bread together and continue to put relationships and living life together, um, put that first with Jesus, and so um, that's what we believe we're called to do, so this is just kind of, this is where we're going, right? This is, this is where we, we believe the Lord is leading us um, to, to, to grow our space, to add more parking, to add more entrances in um, to our building, to make it more handicap accessible. Like, we can't touch anything because nothing in this church is handicap accessible, which means then you got to do everything to make it handicap accessible. So there's all of these things. And so there... There is something to chew on. <laughs> we want to hear from you. We want your feedback. I know that this was fast, and it might be a lot for some of you, or maybe not. I don't know. Um, but this is, this is where we believe that the Lord is leading us. Um, how do we get here? We're not. Let me repeat this. We are not going to do a capital building campaign. We will not do... A capital campaign here where I put pressure on you to give money towards a building. We will not do that here at this church. All right? I'm going to just, I'm going to stand on that. Um, how we're going to get here is the people that the Lord has entrusted to be a part of the lakes are going to sow into what God's doing here. That's how we're going to get there. Um, and so if this is a vision that you really want to champion, then, I, then I'd ask all of you to pray. How can you give more to what the Lord is doing here at the lakes? Because this is our storehouse. This is the place that feeds us. And so we sow into that, and we, we are obedient to that. Um, but but I, just, I just want to throw that out there um, as far as what we're not going to do. And, but we're going to believe that the Lord is going to provide a way. And we're not going to set it like... I have a timeline in my head that I feel like the Lord has planted in me, but I'm not going to say, like, we need to raise X amount of money by this date, because that's not what we're, we're not here to build a building, we're here to build the kingdom of God, and so that's what we're going to give to, and that's what we're going to pursue, and when it's there, we'll do it. So if you don't like the bathroom... Um, let's pray, Lord. I just, we love you, Lord. We want to worship you and glorify you. You are the Lord. You are in charge here, God. Your presence is above all. It's above all of our plans. It's above all of our building. It's bigger than our four walls. It's bigger than any of us, Lord. It's all about you. This is all about you, Lord. This, you have given us a beautiful building. You have given us a place where, where the, um, the, the leaders have been financial stewards. So, Lord, that we're in a place of absolutely no debt. You know, we're, we're in just a great standing, Lord, so that we have a tool to minister your gospel in. So, Lord, we thank you for that. And, Lord, I thank you for each and every person here. And I thank you for what you're doing in their life. And, Lord, I just pray that you continue to use us, each and every single one of us, to touch others with your love and your gospel. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. We love you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I just want to say that, um, you know, we have talked a lot about this with our leadership teams, with our trustee council, and with our spiritual leadership team. And we're just really excited about 